morning, everyone. My name is John. I'm here with my wife, Abigail. Um, as we bring uh, greetings from Milton, Ontario, about 45 minutes west of Toronto. Uh, our, we are enjoying a weekend here uh, in Halifax, um, in Nova Scotia, where we honeymooned here 19 years ago. Um, we uh, left our five kids at home. Um, so we want to please pray for the grandparents that are involved. Um, but yeah, it's a real treat. Uh, I, like Ross, I am also emotional and thinking about uh, connection and also just the life I live. And it's been really great to engage and worship with you um, and hear you sing so loudly. It's wonderful. I love it uh, enthusiastically. And I... I pick up all these threads while I'm here, and I see the Chosen video, and I think when all hope is lost, he finds us. And then I think about the words that I brought this morning. I took 100 steps in the wrong direction and took one back to see God run the, run the other 99. Um, I would like to open with a song um, called You Care. And <clears throat> it pulls from Psalm 13 and 22, which is around those seasons of losing hope. Uh, and what I love about the Psalms is that honesty and authenticity of the struggle and knowing where your hope is, is from the Lord. Um, now, I'm a hip-hop artist. I, I, I do rap, so I, I don't know if you've ever had rap in this church, but uh, you will be blessed today. But for, the, um, for those uh, uninitiated, we've provided the words up on the screen. And, um, and uh, the chorus, uh, well, this one will be uh, hopefully one you can catch, uh, catch and sing along with. It goes, uh, I know that you care for me. I know that you care for me. Even when I fight to get my way. Even when I fight the urge to pray. You care. And it is singing truth that we need to affirm uh, to encourage our hearts and uh, find hope. Let's roll. I know that you care. I know that you care for me. I know you care. I know that you care for me. I know you do. I Even you when I try to get my way. Get in my way, yeah. Even when, when I fight the urge to pray. Yeah, you care. You see, miracles are every day and I'm patiently waiting for what the Savior say lately it's been quiet and cloudy faint and haze my senses can't make sense but faith remains I set my sights on hope I'll take the danger pay sometimes life seems remote like danger bay my body's breaking down Lord am I made this way and sorrow makes rounds and a brother is afraid to pray change the way I see today is a process and to be honest I've been locked into a Loch Ness only obsessed with knowing its ways. Throwing days in dismay is making me a hot mess. Well, God bless the child who is unsure. Needs slow to bend in penitent posture. God bring your child the strength to endure. I'm sidelined asking for a place on the rock. I know that you care for me. I know you care. Even when I find the urge to 
Thank you. Well, I come today uh, humbly. Uh, met with some uh, some folks yesterday. We'll um, maybe share a little bit with that to you today. Some folks visiting from Fredericton and Prince Edward Island, Christians um, seeking the Lord. And we talked about, you know, what we like about church or what we'd like to see about, about church and um, really discussing the resistance to the urge to put on perfect faces like we are all good. And uh, a brother I was talking to said, no, it should be broken people. And so I come to you a broken person this morning um, with my own hurts and hang-ups and uh, a faith in the Lord and um, a willingness to share what has been placed on my heart. I come uh, nervous as well, um, having sp uh, spoken and written a number of times on this subject and, and talking about a Christ-centered uh, approach to race-based issues, knowing that um, we're all in different parts of the journey here and have variant experiences and variant stories and narratives and um, we come together gathered as a body all right, of believers and wanting to care for one another. And so I, I come with all of it and um, uh, humbly just to present to you and, and hopefully you, uh, you can hear and, and engage and we can move forward together. Where we begin is, uh, is a discussion that my wife and I often have about you know, life in Canada life in Ontario, how do we characterize our days, how do we characterize our weeks? Well, we go to work, I'm a high school teacher, um, my wife is, uh, uh, was a midwife for a long time, works in hospital management, and we have five kids and um, all the things that they might get into um, and just parenting and running the house and we can go to work Monday through Friday, uh, relax on Saturday. Well, maybe not us because the five kids are running around all the time, but folks can relax on a Saturday and go to church on Sunday. And we've, you know, we've grown up in a variety of different church experiences and um, Christian communities. And uh, I, I, for one, am very used to, you know, things like Missions Sunday, right, which is the one time of the year where we talk about missionaries that maybe we support or consider the work um, being done not here. Uh, and then we have another Sunday where we talk about the persecuted church, and it's the one Sunday a year where we consider um, our brothers and sisters and their experiences, um, but again, things that are happening not here. And in our Monday to Friday to Saturday to Sunday, it is questionable, at least to me, how much we have to, um, how much we have to sacrifice to be a Christian. What do we put at risk, even relative to our friends, our brothers and sisters around the world? Sometimes there are, sometimes there are perks to being a Christian. Being a part of a community, fellowship, does anybody remember potlucks? There's incredible um, times together and support through difficult times. Um, it doesn't necessarily have an impact on our reputation. Um, doesn't necessarily have an impact on our finances or our relationships. And I say those in general terms because, of course, we are living in a world uh, as believers where we are asked to deny ourselves, right? And that can impact the way we spend our money or the way we spend time with people. Um, but as my wife and I start to consider, you know, folks living not here, we wonder, are we ever going to lose our job, um, our f freedom to gather and worship, our um, freedom, right, to be imprisoned or our lives because of our faith. And in this context, I call it comfortable. And it can be really easy to forget um, your calling within comfort. Now, not many of us are going to go over there. And hopefully you, you pick up what I'm putting down when I say that. We are, 
um, and especially if you've grown up in a Christian context, right? That, that mission Sunday is always somebody over there. And we don't align ourselves as strongly as we can as missionaries here, domestically called and on mission. So we know that those folks are there and we're, that's probably not us. And then there are folks that come and stand up here every Sunday and they get paid to do that. That's their job. And then we go to our jobs out here and again, in comfort, forget calling. If you have your Bibles, um, you can turn to Matthew 10. We're going to read four verses, verses 38 to 42. Matthew 10, verses 38 to 42. I'm reading ESV. I'm also going to read the message, so I'm going to go twice. Um, and uh, you, en you engage with uh, your translation, and we will meet together. In Matthew 10, verse 38. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives him, no, sorry, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet, the one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's award, reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cold cup of water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. From the message, the same passage. If you don't go all the way with me through thick and thin, you don't deserve me. If your first concern is to look after yourself, you'll never find yourself. But if you forget about yourself and look to me, you'll find both yourself and me. We are intimately linked in this harvest work. Anyone who accepts what you do accepts me which is the one who sent you. Anyone who accepts what I do accepts my father who sent me. Accepting a messenger of God is as being good as being God's messenger. Accepting someone's help is as good as giving someone's help. This is a large work I've called you to into, but don't be overwhelmed by it. It's best to start small. Give a cool cup of water to someone who is thirsty, for instance. The smallest act of giving or receiving makes you a true apprentice, and you won't miss out on a thing. If you have been long in the faith, you've heard the term, pick up your cross and follow me. And when I think about us in our Canadian context, and the idea of engaging the hurting, or listening to our calling, being on mission here, not over there, here, what does God require of us? Sometimes that might mean giving up comfort. Jesus called us out and said it was dangerous work. We're in a spiritual fight in Matthew 10, as, as Jesus discussed with his disciples for their first mission. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. That work, that, those words um, from the first mission from the disciples echo to us. It echoed to the early church, and it echoes to us. Even as we watch brothers and sisters persecuted for their faith, we see it's dangerous work. Some of you may have come from those places where it is dangerous. And I think... I know this reality, but I am here, not facing the same risks or threats of danger, free to worship, free to proclaim the gospel in our land. Praise God for that freedom. And when I spent time thinking 
empathizing, putting myself in the shoes of those who are persecuted. I think about the variety of responses that emerge, and you might recognize yours as well. We might feel ambivalent about something that's happening way over there. We might feel helpless because what are we to do? We might feel guilty for our own freedom. And we have what others don't. Or we might feel guilty that we are ambivalent. Guilt can drive us to ignore the issue. We'd shut down. Why would we? Why would we continue to subject ourselves to the knowledge of a reality that's just going to make us feel bad? In fact, if we ignore the issue, then our lives can continue pretty much unaffected. Monday to Friday, Saturday and Sunday. We can go to work, we can play, we can worship, and we are experiencing the downside of our comfort, which again can be a response to stuff that makes us feel bad. When I was in teacher's college, yikes, 17 years ago, I was introduced to this concept, this word we talked, this, what we talked about. In our comfort, there are things that we do not have to consider and our lives will continue. And it was called privilege. Now, I'm, I mentioned that word. I'm gonna say two words that, um, th in this, this morning that make people mad. And I don't know where you are with that. I'm going to do my best to break down where those come from and hopefully that you can engage. Because um, I remember 17 years ago going from my class to a small group with the church that we were, um, where we were worshiping and saying, I learned this interesting thing in class about privilege and about white privilege and the blank stares. What do you mean? Well, it's this idea that um, privilege is getting something that other people don't get. Ooh, the cold resistance that came my way from my brothers and sisters. Privilege means you get something that other people don't. You didn't earn it, and you might not necessarily deserve it. You're, we are here. And for those of us born here, whether that is um, the city, the province, the country, Do we deserve freedom from religious persecution? Or is it just where we are? Where we were born? The word and concept of privilege have become a discussion in North America in recent years. Um, again, uh, revived in public discourse around um, the shooting of Michael Brown in 2014 in Ferguson, Missouri. Um, we've had many touch points of uh, key cases in Canada and North, Amer in, uh, North America or in the years since then. Um, our world started to talk about unequal or unethical treatment of different people groups, um, how certain segments of society receive some things that others don't. We talked about a two-tier justice system. We talked about um, not only the unequal treatment of women as it relates to pay, but also um, socially with things like Me Too and rape culture. Uh, we talked about political policies that were discriminatory. We've talked about Islamophobia, refugees, trans rights, media representation, and idle no more. These conversations had been going on for years, and they find these various cultural touch points that make it alert to all of us. And I'm sure that many of us can pinpoint one of those from three years ago with the murder of George Floyd. Some folks had knowledge of these discussions, and for others it was um, becoming alert. We were becoming alert to them uh, in 2014 as the streets of Ferguson filled up every night with angry protesters and police squads with military gear taking on unarmed citizens.
as a teacher, I try and stay on top of these issues. Some things move me more than others. And to me, that denotes things that I'm connected to. So yesterday, I sat down at the fancy restaurant, The Bicycle Thief, with uh, these eight other folks, Fredericton, Prince Edward Island, and I had a conversation with um, a couple that this is their sixth year in Canada, coming from Guadalajara to Fredericton. And I asked them this simple question, have you felt welcomed? 100% yes was the answer. Glowing faces lighting up as they told us about the church community that they joined and the number of small tips, hints to prepare for the winter, to help with their kids, so many pitfalls or things they could have fallen into or not been prepared for, but for the church, just being kind and welcoming, bringing them in. They feel completely welcomed in this country and love being a part of their church community. And then the face dropped just a little bit when they said, we recognize that that's our experience and being part of the, this church knowing that so many other families and people that come to this country don't have the same connections and opportunities. And he said, I can't separate those two experiences. I can't only be thankful for what we've been given without recognizing that there are people uh, in pain that need support. That's the spark. We carry that with us. We do. Our family has this uh, tradition that we birthed during the pandemic called Corbin Fest. Um, and it is evolving, but it's a family holiday. We just made it up uh, because we wanted something to look forward to while we were locked down. And we pick from a list of our favorite things to do and we try and cram as much of it into the day as possible. I don't think we've ever completed a list, but it's a worthy effort. One of the reasons we can't complete the list is because the, our favorite things to do are only crammed into half the day. That's for us. In the morning, we find things to do for others. We want our kids oriented in service. And so we start to talk, think, as a group, 13, 11, 8, 8, and 8. I'll give you a moment. <laughs> Who do we know that could use some support? I got to tell you, what comes from them is that spark, that thing, that what they're connected to. It's often connected to their experience or their pain. My mom, single mother, raising two boys. My mom, white mother, raising two mixed race, black presenting boys. When I come to our family table, I always say, there are some single mothers that we know that can use some support. We carry that with us. That's the spark, right? So when I read about Michael Brown's lifeless body being left on a Ferguson street for four hours, and then when I watched protesters fill those streets and be attacked by police, I cried. That's what I carry with me. I cry because of the disconnect in the community. I cry learning that it was not just that, 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 that those streets filled up because of decades of contentious relationships between African-American communities and the police. More and more people started to tell their story and share and testify. And you see a pattern emerge. And I cry. I make the connection between that teenager and um, Emmett Till from 1955. 
and how the lynching victim of a 14-year-old boy was served as a beacon or a harbinger to all the country that this is what can happen if you cross a social line. And this young man's face on the front of every newspaper, it was not just a message to the larger majority white population. It was to black kids Stay in line. We had the same issue with a young man that was recently shot in the United States for ringing on the wrong doorbell. And one of my friends who works at the CBC as a content creator, young black man, posted and really struck me. He said, we got black kids watching this news cycle. And they have to work and interpret what that means. They are watching. We are carrying that. That's a spark. I'm taking a long way to get to this, yeah, idea of privilege. Because it's used in a bunch of, it can use, be used in a bunch of different contexts, financial, in, financial inequality age, disability, ethnicity or race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, social class. And then 17-ish years ago, sitting in teacher's college and reading Peggy McIntosh's essay, now famous essay, Unpacking the Knapsack, White Privilege and Relate to, to, to Racial Context, use the imagery of the backpack to say that white Americans have these tools that other people don't have. The back was in, bag was invisible because white folks didn't know that they were carrying it. She says, I, tried, I decided to work on myself and identify some of the daily effects of this privilege in my life. And as far as I can tell, and as far as I can study, this is what she says, African Americans can't count on most of these conditions. And there was a long list of which I will provide a small highlight. Number six on that list, I can turn on the television or open up the front page of the newspaper and see my race widely represented. Number eight, I can be sure that my children will be given curriculum materials in school that testify to the existence of their race. Number 11, I can be casual about whether or not to listen to another person's voice in a group in which they are the only member of their race. Now, being a teacher in a public system west of Toronto, that's been in my experience most of the time. It was about 10 years before I taught in a building with another black teacher. Number 15, I do, not have to I do not have to educate my children to be aware of any systemic racism for their own daily physical protection. 21, I'm never asked to speak for all the people of my racial group. 25, if a traffic cop pulls me over, I can be sure I haven't been singled out because of my race. And again, from my experience, it's the not being sure that eats away at you. 38, I can think of many options, social, political, imaginative, or professional, without being asked whether a person of my race would be accepted or allowed to do what I want to do. Sitting with these ideas is uncomfortable. And I think back to picking up the cross, my being laying some of these things down. Folks, there are many parallels to this beyond race. And what it requires is us being willing to engage the stories of others. The uncomfortable truth is that if we choose to ignore these stories, life can go on, as will the risks and the challenges to these groups. But I gotta tell you, 
I have seen growth in the discomfort and being willing to lay down those things that make us so that we would push them away, the same as we consider our brothers and sisters in churches around the, the world that are persecuted. I've seen growth in that personally and in groups for those willing to engage. It's uncomfortable, but that's where the growth is. I have also seen the resistance, and it comes in a variety of different forms. When starting to talk about um, folks that have settled on this country and the nations that were here first, or when talking about African-Canadian communities, plural, and we start to testify to our experience, we get back, that's not me. I've never owned a slave. I'm not racist, or worse, I'm not racist, but that's always a sign. I'm colorblind. I don't see color. Why are we focusing on the past? Certainly there are more important things that we can deal with. Let's just focus on the gospel. All lives matter. We reach for these defensive responses to avoid an accusation or a label that we are racist or sexist or ableist or discriminatory towards any people group. We're just plain ignoring them. Privilege means you can do so. And in doing so, you're missing out on a key calling for your work right here. Micah 6, with what shall I come before the Lord? He has told you, O oh man, do what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly? James 1, religion that is pure and undefiled is this, to visit the orphans and the widows in their affliction, to keep oneself unstained from the world. Psalm 146, the Lord protects the foreigners among us. He cares for the orphans and the widows and frustrates the plans of the wicked. Right now, people are testifying to the inequities of their experience. And they're being argued with, contradicted, and shouted down. Over this stretch of time, let's say even just within the last 10 years, and we know that there's so much more in our history, when you see you see it in the ways that um, the media quickly finds dirt on the victims of someone subject to violence from the state. Essentially arguing that they deserved to die in a dehumanizing fashion. You can see it on social media when folks say, well, we don't have all the facts, or um, I'd like to see the whole video, or, or maybe they shouldn't have reached for their wallet. We are overriding empathy and arguing with the widows and the fatherless. And we live in a system that presents that as okay, but it's not what God asks of us. And sometimes we can answer clearly and confid confidently that we individually are not racist, but yet we can participate and defend a system that is harming people. Keep yourself unstained from the world. And as Canadians, we have been in involved in the sin of ignoring our First Nations brothers and sisters who are testifying to the inequity and are mired in several crises, plural, lack of safe environment, hopelessness leading to mass suicides or a larger proportion of suicides, loss of land, loss of culture, loss of language, educational agency. Are First Nations solely victims? No. Are they deserving to have the ear of Canadians so they can express their perspective and we can move forward together? Absolutely. And despite the church's history of abusing First Nations, they are deserving of our ear and empathy even more. This, is, this leads me to the second word that make people mad. Because giving up your privilege means listening to the narratives that are not dominant in our culture. That is called being woke. 
It is being aware, knowing what's going on in the community, and that's it. Spin and redefinition and arguing, and I can say certain words that will either make people upset or feel controversial. It originated with being aware. That's it. The biblical approach to this awareness we see in a variety of places. We saw it with uh, Nehemiah and lament. With the strife facing his nation, he felt it and prayed. Go and read Nehemiah's prayer. It was not for him and his feelings, but the sins of the nation. He was not directly involved in them. So that spark, that thing that you feel, go to God with your distress. That could be your care or concern for others or your discomfort around this idea that maybe there are voices that we haven't been listening to that affect our community and the experience they have within that community. From there, we need to be very careful about our response and make sure that we are listening. Who are you listening to? Who are you reading or watching? What perspectives might you be missing? Are you willing to stop talking for a moment? Then examine your relationships. Who do you spend time with? Do you have opinions about certain people or people groups, but no personal experience to back it up? Are you avoiding certain relationships because of experiences you've had in the past? I have been guilty of that. I wrote a piece um, this year about supporting black lives specifically, but I think the principle remains in whatever um, people group or perspective you're willing to learn um, so for Black Lives, I made the, uh, I sort of made a, a item a month that we could do. In January, Martin Luther King Day gets celebrated. I would say that in my experience, as someone that uses social media, I have engaged way more memes of Martin Luther King quotes than his actual writing. I think that needs to change. In January, I engage Martin Luther King. In February, learn about Canadian black history. And there's a wealth of it. When we honeymooned out here, we learned a lot about Canadian black history that we had no idea about. And I was schooled in this country. And then came March and April, where we are now. And the hardest part, and what folks responded to me as this the most challenging, is engaging someone in your context. So whether that's a parent at a hockey arena or um, someone you know from your work, um, wherever your community lies, is there someone from a different perspective that you'd like to learn more about? Buy them a coffee. Ask some questions. Listen to their story. Just be curious and engage, not with agenda, to connect. Be that safe person that is interested in others. And then in April, buy them a meal. Talk some more and ask this question. When it comes to supporting black lives, what are you the most concerned about? What areas are you interested in? If you talk to me, we'd start talking about worship and the kingdom of God. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And I would say, when we get up there, are we going to sing in English? Not all the time. <laughs> are we going to sing? I'm not going to rag on any of the small number of uh, musical groups that inform a large amount of our worship, but it seems disproportionate to me. Are those the only kinds of songs we're going to sing? Not all the time. So what does the kingdom look like here? What does the kingdom look like here? 
How could that, that's, I don't talk to you about that for a long time. If you ask that question, when it comes to blank issue, what are you concerned about? You've shown yourself to be safe and engaging and not only for an agenda. You're asking a question. You don't even know how you're going to respond. You hope that the connection would yield something that you would then be able to share or advocate for. You'd hope. But you don't necessarily need to become some kind of warrior. You are just providing care. A cold cup of water. And I think often about Jesus' parable about the sheep and the goats and how we will be separated by our willingness to care for those that have need. And I think that's a great spark for me, again, remembering that we are here on mission. Something that you can take to help the health of this community, which I can't speak to. I don't know how healthy it is. But it's something that you can take to your context and your community, creating more connections. And I got to tell you, from my experience as an artist and a black presenting man, there's a lot of black artists, black folks and black artists leaving the church because that care can't be provided. And I want to share with you a song that talks about this. I know that I'm, I'm, I'm a verbose person. I'm sorry. <laughs> I want to share with you a song that talks about this to, to close. And it is this um, encouragement around um, uh, awareness, really. Are we willing to connect? Are we willing to be aware? And... Over the, um, over the time of lockdowns, one word that came up in the issue of justice was amplify. And it was folks being willing to take a step back, identify who from these marginalized communities or um, minority communities are speaking and give them voice. And it was um, the first step away from a posture of like knowledge and putting on our best. Well, you know, I know, have known so many black people over the years and we've had many connections with folks and I think that makes me, uh, uh, that makes me qualified to make that racial joke. And it doesn't work. Um, to do justice and walk humbly is to acknowledge what we don't know and being willing to contribute to the community of God, the family of God, by learning and understanding and providing care. So I want to do a song uh, around that idea. It's called Amplify. And I talk specifically about um, uh, police-related violence and some of the, the moments, the touchstone moments from 2020 and 2021. And um, a reminder that God cares. That's it. Let's run it. <laughs> Condition to hate, man, they struggle to feel. Streets of crimson tide, cause they come in with steel. Cops popping two guns with tasks to do. American gangsters attacking you. See the news every day, it's deja vu. Cry freedom for the days, cause the blacks are blue, man. What's a Whitlock mat to do? Take flight overnight, the past a few. Should we pray for the fallen like the pastors do? Fight to equalize or retract your crew. Claim the basis is race, it's a gory debate. Then the streets rise up, now they glory in hate. The story relates to hurricanes fighting. They soon come, they'll remember these titans who amplify. Amplify. Take 
in the street named after Mr. Aubrey after Miss Taylor they finally changing the policy will a Mr. Floyd face on the wall possibly convince you that he was God's property man you clap back it's a backtrack we stand in as humans you say we have that now dignity is dignity humanity humanity and I am indignant that you think dignity is insanity Look, the statement you fight, the way that ignites our division, you're insistent. I'm the one that incites, but I'm the one with the Christ who stands with the ostracized, weeping for the people who feel fear every night. God hears their prayers like 5G telephone, charges his hands to make sure they ain't left alone. Feet on the street, unrest is the stepping stone. Somebody pass me a pen pad and a megaphone to amplify. Hear our voices. get stuck in any kind of navel gazing that would say how could I not have seen that please call us towards connection and love Lord help us to lay down the privilege that says that we don't have to care help us to take the focus off ourselves provide us the opportunity to learn from the experiences of the hurting and in view of God's mercy empower us to act as Jesus would as the spirit prompts Lord remind us through the power of your word to provide justice and care to visit those that are sick to help the hurting to help those in prison to feed the hungry to help the f to give drinks to the thirsty lord confirm in us the spark that leads us to a mission here to provide a cold cup of water lord may grace chapel grow from this a year from now more testifying more testimonies of the way that we have drawn together even closer as a community that they would be a beacon to people saying how that would say how they loved each other knowing that this work of multiculturalism takes time it's harder to do than to just have one system set in place and everyone conforms to it no your kingdom come lord your will be done lord may this church be a beacon for those around that folks folks here from various communities can invite their friends their community say you will be loved here you will be valued here you will be honored here and when there is hurt that relates to your community or your experience they will be there to hold you they will be there to share the love of God. Lord, it is only by your spirit and your power. And if we are going to, um, to do any of that, to pick up our cross, we lay down the fact that we don't have to care. We're going to start there and watch you work. Prepare us 
in this town. Prepare us in this province. And prepare grace for the works that you can do to continue to bind us together. Your kingdom come. In Jesus' name. Uh, John, I'll put you on the spot. You got one more for us? So I don't know if we're like, <laughs> we Are have you a little bit of fun before we head out. Should we stand for this one? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's stand for this one. We'll yeah. do our benediction afterwards. Okay, yeah. Um, this, there's, there's no words. You just got to feel this one. This, it's called Back to the Basics, which makes a lot of sense. I'll give you a bit of context. Um, I work too hard. I got five kids, I'm a teacher, I'm a, a devoted parent and a loving partner, and I like to make music. I work too hard. I like making music, but it stresses me out. And my wife says, have fun. Live in the moment that you're given. And, um, and I think this relates all over the place. Let's run this, we're gonna have some fun. If you um, yeah, run the track, how many people have never seen hip hop l perform live before today? I've never seen a hip hop show before, live before today. You're my favorite people. You are my favorite people. We're not gonna make you do anything like put your hands in the air, say ho or anything like that. We're just gonna, just it's just movement, right? Uh, my, my brothers and sisters from Africa say that um, when you're in church, worship is a whole body experience, right? So if you are like less, connected to that rhythm within, then you're going to, you know, you're just two step it out a little bit, but do it to the praise of the Lord. So if you haven't, if you're less familiar, um, you're going to catch some words, but you're going to sing with me back to the basics, because that's what we're trying to get to. Right? Yeah, yeah. Huh. I spent my moment in prayer, trying to get a hold of the multiple visions my mind unfolds. I seek tender control of just one goal, and now our heart strolls to a new drum roll. Most high my pipe piper, sight set higher than number one. I'ma play the host, Makai Pfeiffer. Holy Spirit's the lamp, the sight lighter. Now we're working as a team, Night Rider. The next step is the best yet. Brothers and sisters in faith are invited to the guest deck. Band together in unity, suppress death. You and me, soon to be taking flight with jet set. Abandon lust, stand with us. Elevated egos get cancerous. But an ego laid down is a man to trust. A standing bus with those who will dance with us. And get back, back to the basics. I'm trying to get back to the basics. Lift my eyes, take in the sun. Say, John, you better have fun. And I'm trying to get back, back to the basics. I'm trying to get back to the basics. Live to make music, but can't hit the road lots. Try to keep moving, pause at some roadblocks. Nostalgia, happy visit in some old spots. Sometimes I know not, at least the flow's hot. The deep me on a beat, greener pasture. Standing too high, seems I fiend for disaster. Leaned on my own strength like peace to the master. You can say I had it backwards. Well, now it's back to the basics, like beats and rhymes. Seeking out moments to free my mind. Because the Most High said, if you seek, you'll find. So I'm always on watch to peep the sign. I surrender control. Hoeing this road I chose. Praying for peace in the overload. Man, I seek new clothes and a new way of living. To live in the moment I'm given. I'm trying to get back. Back to the basics. I'm trying to get back to the basics. Lift my eyes. Take in the sun. And say, John, you better have fun. Man, I'm trying to get back. What? Trying to get back to the basics. Lift my eyes, take in the sun. And say, John, you better have fun. And I'm trying to get back. Back, back to the basics. Back, back to, to the, the basics. basics. Oh, it's so great to worship with you. I'm trying to get back. Back, back to the basics. I'm trying to get back, back to the basics. Oh, oh, oh. Thank you so much.